Sorry about that, Charles. Uh, we didn't, at the risk of giving you flashbacks, we thought that uh, everyone should see some of what you've had to deal with uh, over the past few months as you have simply sought to go to speak where invited by authorized groups on campus. Uh, and once again, my name is Tom Giovanetti. We're so delighted that you could be here today. Uh, it has been jolting to many of us uh, this year. It seemed like out of nowhere you had this thing spring up to where suddenly uh, violence and intimidation were seen as entirely appropriate tools for shutting down opinions and shutting down speakers who a minority of students disagreed with. I hope you had a chance to see some of the slides that were going on the screens about this poll that was taken a few months ago where stunning percentages, you know, like 38% of students interviewed believed that violence was an appropriate tool to use to shut down certain kinds of speech. 38% uh, may not be a majority, but it's a frightening minority of people who think violence is appropriate for shutting down speech. Uh, I've argued over the years that those of us who are, call ourselves conservatives or who are on the center right made a terrible miscalculation uh, by leaving civil rights issues to the left and to the ACLU. Uh, if you believe in freedom, if you're skeptical of government, if you believe in individual liberty, you should be a champion of civil rights and, and not just of some of the First Amendment, but of all of the First Amendment. Not just the First Amendment, but the Fourth Amendment. And strategically, I think, my team, at least, the center right, made a terrible mistake by ceding the ground on civil rights. And today, I think some of the, that fruit is ripening now, and we're finding ourselves in a situation where we are the group who is being discriminated against, we are the group who's being shut down, and uh, maybe, a, maybe a couple of decades investment in civil rights advocacy on our part would have been useful right now. It's not often, as I said earlier, that uh, you get to host and introduce one of your intellectual heroes, but today is one of those days for me. Uh, Charles Murray, has been one of the most thoughtful and influential writers and speakers over the course of the last several decades, uh, writing serious policy books that truly s try to solve intractable social problems. Uh, Mr. Murray's book, Losing Ground, was one of the most influential policy books of the 20th century and led to significant re-understanding of the welfare problem and of the impact of anti-poverty programs and led to the most significant policy reform of the 90s, the welfare reform. But that's not the only book that Charles has written. Uh, Charles has written a number of books. In fact, Charles has written a very interesting book targeted at young people. Uh, I hope you'll mention that because every one of you students out there should go on Amazon and, and buy Charles's book about how to be successful as a young person, getting started in life, getting started in your career and at school. It's a wonderful little book and you would all find it to be massively useful. Uh, Charles, some of Charles's work has been controversial, but that's also one of the reasons why he's one of my intellectual heroes, because he goes where the data is. He, is, he has been fearless, but also compassionate. And you cannot solve intractable policy problems until you first understand the problem. And Charles's work, if you could summarize it in just one sentence, it has been helping us truly understand in great depth many of these policy problems. Uh, when government says, oh, we've got to solve this problem, and they don't understand what the problem is, most of the times things go from bad to worse. But Charles's work has helped us to actually do some significant policy reforms uh, that he has actually lived to see, which must be gratifying to some degree. You know, when, when you're a writer and thinker and when you're in the policy business, you have more failures than successes. Uh, but you have been able to see some successes over the course of your career, and that I, I hope that's gratifying to you. You're not here to hear me talk, you're here to hear Charles Murray talk. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you uh, one of my heroes and, and someone that if you don't know, someone you're gonna get to know today, Charles Murray. Thanks, Tom, uh, but I'm afraid I've been so triggered by that video that I can't go on. <clears throat> Look, the topic today is free speech on campus, and a lot of it has been framed in terms of things like the Middlebury incident, and I don't want to downplay the importance of it, but you've got 
I think, a different free speech issue on campus than you have in the public at large. When you're talking about the public at large, I'm a free speech absolutist. The First Amendment absolutely applies. The college campus is different uh, in this regard. Let's say that I'm, I'm a college president. What I want is to further the free discourse, civil discourse, scholarly discourse on important topics, whether they are the works of Shakespeare or whether it's physics or whether it's social science. And to that end, if there is somebody who is going to come on campus and use evidence and use logic and also use collegial civility, it is not my job as president of the university to decide whether I agree with this person or not, and neither is it uh, appropriate for the prevailing opinion among the faculty or the students influence my decision. That person is eligible. If it's a person who delights in being a provocateur, who says repellent things, who uh, is not trying to foster discourse, but is uh, trying to make a splash, as president of the university, I feel no compulsion whatsoever to say, oh, we gotta give this guy a platform. So we're talking about a form of free speech which is really important, but I think is subject to a different set of ground rules than free speech in general. And the second distinction I would make is when you've seen a shutdown of free speech on the campus, you have seen it partially for outside speakers like me. But guest speakers giving an occasional lecture are not the stuff of a college education. It's what goes on uh, all the time in every lecture and every course you take. And you have another kind of stifling of free speech in the university that is far more pernicious than shutting down Charles Murray. And that's making professors walk on eggshells as they're trying to convey their subject matter. So it's in those uh, terms that I want to talk about why, what's gone on, what, what has led to this situation as to whether I'm going to end the speech by telling you how to fix it, don't get your hopes up. Um, I am a libertarian, and libertarians don't do solutions. That's my, that's my position, and I'm sticking to it. I think you've got three big things that I want to talk briefly about today. One is the change to telos of the university. The second one is a certain kind of new fragile student that is increasingly evident in the university. And the third is changes in the way the universities operate. Start out with the change telos. Telos is a Greek word. It refers basically to purpose. It has more nuances than that. And I am picking up on the work of Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist at New York University. He, he says, look, the, the telos of a university, the reason it's around is the pursuit of truth either expressed uh, to, to students so that they know the best that has been thought and said uh, throughout history, or in the course of the research conducted at the university where you actually expand your knowledge of the truth. And you can't have, a co you can't have two purposes at the same time. And he contrasts that with the other purpose which has arisen, which is the pursuit of social justice. And you go on to campuses, and there are all sorts of professors on that campus who will now tell you the, the purpose of a, of a university is to further the pursuit of social justice. Never mind how social justice is defined, even if we defined it in ways which were ideologically congenial to us, Height's point is, you can't do that. You cannot have as your purpose the pursuit of truth and, by the way, the pursuit of some uh, agenda which depends on a certain way of the world being. And if, if, if that's not the truth, the university has to be able to uh, correct that situation. And what you have had with the rise of identity politics is the, the decay, undermining of the purpose of the university. Identity politics, well, let me tell you what I mean by it. Essentially, what it says is that I no longer think of myself as Charles Murray, a particular individual with a particular set of personality characteristics and cognitive abilities and preference and tastes and experiences and the rest of that, I am white, I am male, I am heterosexual. Those three things are the basic components of my identity and I am unable to speak meaningfully to the experience 
of someone who is black and female and homosexual. And that applies to all the permutations. Uh, it is literally true that I am illegitimate in saying anything about that other person whose experience I cannot enter into. And by the way, that also gives me the right to say, well, you can't say anything about me. Nothing you say uh, understands the anguish and the complications of being white and male and heterosexual. Uh, it, it shuts down all kinds of social and intellectual intercourse because you just have a blanket veto on the legitimacy of what other people are saying. It also leads to a very strong sense of victimization because everybody sees themselves at being at the bottom of the heap. And, and, so, and one of the things that has happened, by the way, politically in the last couple of years is that all it's as if I'm going to be this is the kind of thing that get me in trouble, by the way, if, uh, if it gets out, because what I'm going to say is I'm not making it nuanced, and that's, of course, a very dangerous thing to say. In the last couple of years, what you've had, a lot of white males saying, hey, I'm a victim too, and I've been victimized the last 30 years. People have been calling me a racist and a sexist and a homophobe, and I'm not any of those things. Poor little me. And uh, it's okay for white males to get upset about this as well. All of this... It's going on in the university at a level which makes everybody respond to it even if they are not part of it. And the degree to which it controls the university depends a lot, I think, on its size. I was at the University of Michigan last uh, week ago, Wednesday, and there was a thing similar to the Middlebury episode, not quite as bad. But you know what? Uh, I think that if you went out and collected uh, 50 random University of Michigan students. I doubt if you'd have more than half a dozen of them who shared the, the, the views that were being uh, expressed in the, uh, in the protest against me. I think most of the kids are pretty much like they've always been politically not that interested in many cases and certainly not all wrought up about it. But the thing is, all you need is a minority of a couple of hundred or maybe a thousand such students within the large university. They can organize a protest like that. The entire milieu of the university isn't necessarily uh, reflecting that. But you take a college of a couple of thousand students like Middlebury, you may only have a couple of hundred students there who are uh, the leaders of the mindset I described. When the school is that small, they can have a very intimidating effect on everybody else. So I don't know how many we're talking about. I think a lot of universities are functioning out there in this regard, pretty much unchanged. I think the problem is concentrated in the most elite universities. But that is a problem because the most elite universities are turning out a lot of people who have a lot of influence in the polity. Let me turn now to the second cluster of things, and that is uh, the rise of the fragile undergraduate. Now, I am sure that none of the Sumner scholars are like this. I'm sure that uh, none of the other students here, but there are a bunch of other people who do fit my description, as I bet you could, you could uh, confirm. It's a function, I think, of changed parenting styles to some degree. It's also a function of the degree to which you have, especially in the upper middle class, a kind of ethos that did not exist before, but for whatever reason you have coming into our universities, and especially into our elite universities, uh, students who have been the victims of excessively happy childhoods. They, they have had warm and sympathetic and patient and understanding parents. They have gone to schools where they have been taught by patient and understanding teachers. They have uh, then matriculated into a college which uh, has warm and patient and understanding professors, they get to college basically without ever having had a summer job working construction, without ever having stood behind a sales counter for uh, eight hours on Saturday in a part-time job, without having waited tables, without having uh, ever had an adult scream at them, except maybe the occasional taxi driver. Uh, th so they, they, they essentially get to college with all of the resilience of a crystal champagne flute. And by the way, this is a topic 
to, to those of you who are students in the Curmudgeon's Guide. This is the book that uh, was referred to. It's called The Curmudgeon's Guide to Getting Ahead. And there I'm bringing that to your attention, saying, look, if you're like this, if you've had this kind of upbringing and you haven't gotten beat up, I don't mean physically beat up, if you haven't been beat up by life a little bit by the time you get to college, you've got to take proactive steps to beat yourself up. To, uh, to, to put yourself in situations that are out of your comfort zone and so forth. But the effect it has in college life is that the trigger warnings and the safe spaces, these are real things uh, whereby if you are a teacher in a classroom, you are supposed to warn students that you might be talking about something which will make them uncomfortable. And when you have an outside speaker like me, they provide rooms at safe spaces during my lecture and so that I am lecturing somewhere on campus which of course if you don't want to go to the lecture you just stay in your room but no they have a space where people can gather together and bring their teddy bears or whatever it was at Swarthmore a year ago they had such a safe room but for some bizarre reason the safe uh, space room was right next to my green room where I was waiting to go on and I noticed this when I was going out to use the restroom, and I, I, I this is, a, and I, the temptation to have gone and opened the door, go, ha! Ah! It was almost overwhelming, but I, I, I didn't do it because I probably would have caused mental stress that gotten sued. Uh, the phenomenon I'm talking about is real, and it has uh, affected the things that professors can do, even if they want to because they are subject to student evaluations and the, when you've done surveys of what it is that students put on their student evaluations as what they value most, I, can give, I could give you the numbers, they have been accumulated, but the, most, the two most uh, important characteristics of a professor on these students' evaluations are first, whether they are entertaining, and secondly, whether they are warm and, and sympathetic, and that a professor is demanding is nowhere on the list of uh, priorities for the evaluation of a professor. Looking around the room, those of you who've been in college and gotten out, think of the professor who taught you the most, who, who has made the biggest difference in your life, and I am willing to bet that some extremely high percentage of those were people who were demanding and gruff and uh, and pushed you farther than you thought you could be pushed, and at the time you might have hated it. That's the kind of professor who makes a difference, not the one who pats you on the head all the time. And, and the, the new fragile students are systematically reducing the degree to which you end up with those professors. Which leads me to my third complaint, and now I'm talking not about the telos of a university, I'm talking about the way that universities see their day-to-day -day function with regard to the students. It used to be, and I don't think this is nostalgia, this is a pretty straightforward statement of what universities were like. It used to be that the university served as a bridge between adolescence and the adult world. So that your teachers in high school you were kind of buddy-buddy with. And when you get out into the cold, cruel world, you're going to be working in a supervisor-subordinate relationship where, frankly, your boss doesn't really care if he or she has a personal relationship with you. They just want the job done. Well, in between that was the university professor. And with the university professor, uh, no question about ever calling him or her by, by the first name. Uh, it was Professor So-and-so. And whereas the professor might be pleasant, uh, the professor also expected papers to be done on time, and if you slipped, the, if the, it was noon Tuesday that your paper had to be in the uh, uh, submitted, and it wasn't there until 2:30 in the afternoon, it wasn't accepted. And the professor provided a kind of halfway between the high school teacher and the boss. And similarly, in terms of your independence, all at once, mom isn't uh, making your bed in the morning and isn't doing your laundry and they are nowhere to be seen, which is a wonderful liberating sense uh, for, for many of us to remember when we went off to college, but it also means that all at once, all these mistakes that you made uh, when you were 15 and 14 years old that your parents sort of papered over aren't papered over anymore and you've got to deal with them. And that in, t in turn is another way in which you had a bridge between being a child and being an adult. 
As far as I can tell, the way that colleges are administered has been systematically changed so that colleges are administered as if they were trying to prolong adolescence rather than serve as a bridge to adulthood. Some of the symptoms of that, well, one of them is uh, the things I mentioned earlier about flexible deadlines, or if you miss the test, oh yeah, you can come back and you can retake the test. Uh, others of them are the attitudes toward grades. You've all heard about grade inflation. You may not be as familiar with uh, the phenomenon of if you don't like your grade, you confront the professor with it and uh, demand that you get a better one, which was just unheard of for me. I never, that never crossed my mind. I could go in and, and say to a professor, you weren't fair, I actually did better than that, but it happens all the time. And by the way, uh, students, many students feel no compunction whatsoever about calling mom and dad if they feel they've been untreated fairly. And uh, once again, in the good old days, and I realize this sounds like a geezer talking about the old days, but in the good old days, my parents wouldn't have come in on my side in that debate. They, they would have told me to do a better job next time, and now the parents do come in on the student side. And so you not only have an overall grade inflation, you also have something where the, 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 the grade just doesn't mean anything anymore because you can argue hard enough and get it changed in many cases. There is also the question of res staff. Again, thinking back, I had my 50th reunion, by the way, just uh, two years ago, so I'm talking a long way back. But at Harvard, in freshman year, you were in a dormitory and there was one proctor who was usually a grad student in the dorm, and that was it. And so the other support staff for students consisted of the infirmary, so if you were sick or needed surgery or something, that was your support staff. But the idea you had support staff for your emotional needs, for your academic counseling and the rest of that, that was completely alien. The fastest growing uh, population of of staff in colleges has been the resident staff, the staff that they are there to support students in all kinds of ways. Once again, cushioning the, the, the effects of mistakes and once again, diluting the notion that you are in a university with a particular responsibility and that is to master difficult academic material and also to do it on your own. And I guess the other aspect of administering the university that, that has bothered me the most is that the faculty themselves have retreated from definitions of right and wrong. So that it is accepted as a legitimate argument for a student to come up to a professor and say of a sophisticated, complex uh, intellectual issue, well, that's just your opinion. Without offering counter arguments, but just saying, well, that's your opinion and I have my opinion and you have no right to judge that your opinion is better than mine. This is not true in the hard sciences, at least not nearly as much. But even in the hard sciences, I am told, there is some of this leakage that has come in from the social sciences and the humanities. In the humanities and social science departments, it is a bold teacher indeed now who will defend uh, his or her interpretation of Hamlet over the student's interpretation of the Hamlet on grounds that the professor has probed more deeply into the meaning of the words than the student has and it's up the student to, to uh, achieve the same kind of subtlety if he wants to argue with the professor. That, that kind of thing just doesn't happen very often. The reality is that you now have a situation in which Students in the social sciences and the humanities are stifling speech, not just of outside speakers like me, but of their professors and of their fellow classmates, where people are judging what they say by the prospect of being outed in some way socially or in the campus newspaper or otherwise as not just politically incorrect, but a bad person. And in that, you have a suppression of free speech that is vastly more important than anything I have experienced. What do we do about this? 
I like to think that my wife is right about, about the characteristics ultimately of people who become professors. Her point is this, she's talking specific, she by the way is a Oxford, Yale, PhD in terms of, uh, of English literature and she says, you know what, professors are most of all worried about how smart they are relative to their colleagues. It's ironic because a lot of these same professors will be the first to say, oh, IQ doesn't mean anything. There is no human quality that professors value more than their own IQ, but they're nervous about it relative to others. And she says, look, if you're in my field, which is the study of English literature, you don't want to appear stupid to your colleagues. And at some point when you're talking about Henry James or you're talking about Faulkner or the rest of it and you're using some postmodernist interpretation, it's getting to the point where people are going to look at you and say you're silly. The same thing is going to happen in the social sciences over the course of the next 10 years. And I'm going to touch here on uh, some inflammatory issues so I can pause and wait for anybody to walk out uh, if they want to. Right now, you have on the college campus the equivalent of a Nicene Creed of political correctness. You have certain premises, certain fundamental statements that you dare not uh, argue with lest you be identified as a heretic. One of them is race is a social construct. Another one is that gender is a social construct. And the third one is that, that class is decisively causal that what happens to us in life is uh, overwhelmingly determined by where we are in the hierarchy and the patriarchy and the rest of it. There is some truth to all three of those statements. Race is partly a social construct. Gender is partly a social construct. Class is important. All of those are true. But they are not as simplistic as the orthodoxy insists they be that there are other factors going on with all of those which are not scary. They are not going to bring in some awful new understanding of the world. All they're going to do is actually bring the academic understanding of these issues back to something resembling what ordinary people think. Let me give you the illustration. Um, men and women are different. They are different in some biological ways, which not only mean that one sex can produce babies and the other can't, but there are some aspects of personality, of vocational interests, that are different in men and women for biological reasons. That is something which I don't think an ordinary audience drawn at random from the American population are gonna, is going to have any problem with, as long as you don't say it's all biological. You just say it's, it's, it's part of the mix. Well, we are now in a position where neuroscience and genetics is advancing very, very rapidly. And so you have in the social sciences somebody who is doing an analysis, let's say, of uh, the likelihood that a child will be delinquent. And their analyses now have a variety of socioeconomic variables that predict this. The uh, income of the parents, the nature of the neighborhood in which they live, uh, the education of the parents, and so forth and so on. And, and what's going to happen over the next 10 years is you're going to have to take into account the parents' own characteristics as predictors of this. The parents' biological characteristics. If you don't do that, Enough is going to be known 10 years from now about what the role of those biological characteristics are that your analysis just can't be taken seriously. It's going to be a head-on collision between a simplistic ideology, orthodoxy, that has the university in its grip and rapidly increasing knowledge in the hard sciences which say, well, that isn't the whole story. People are scared stiff of that right now. I imagine around the room there has been a certain intake of breath and so what is this guy going to say next? And that's why I've, I, I want to emphasize to you that n none of the things that are being learned in neuroscience and genetics are scary. 
they're just talking about the magnificent, wonderful diversity of this thing called the human animal around the world. It's viva la difference. You don't need to be scared of it, but neither can you pretend that things like this don't exist. And over the ten next, next 10 years, there's going to be have, have to be some kind of collision that is resolved. It would be really nice if it were resolved by people in the social sciences saying, well, weren't we silly? Uh, that wasn't the whole story, and not only that, that, we have now all of these wonderful new tools where we can make giant strides in understanding how the world works, which we weren't able to make until we had this. It's called by the biologist E.O. Wilson, consilience. Consilience meaning you're going to have an integration of the hard sciences and the soft sciences over the course of the 21st century, and we will. That's the optimistic scenario. The pessimistic scenario is that you have some kind of blow up, whereby the social sciences and the humanities can't deal with this, uh, and, and, the, and the current division that exists between the hard sciences and the soft sciences takes on a new character, and with it, the nature of the, the university. I do not have a crystal ball which tells me how this is going to play out. The only thing I'm quite confident of is that this, this uh, collision is on the way. So I don't have solutions except that I think it may end up solving itself, not because we have any changes of heart, but because, guess what? The people who are still doing what universities are supposed to do, pursuing the truth, will add to our knowledge of the truth, will eventually <laughs> Make, make things better for everybody, but we are living in a time which has been as obdurately unwilling to consider the complexities that, of these topics as the most rigid theologian back at the time of the Reformation. I wish I could end with a more positive note. Uh, I guess that I will emphasize what I said earlier. I think a lot of these problems are a minority on campuses among students. You can still go out there and get a good education. But in saying that, we still have to recognize the degree to which free speech on campuses is increasingly becoming a fiction. Thank you very much.